Sharon and Heather, welcome to RN Inside Sleeve. Oh, thank you for having us. Absolutely. You've brought your guitar, which is good. I'm hoping <laughs> you might play something to start. Of course. For you, anything. <laughs>
Sharon Van Etten live on RN Inside Sleeve, accompanied by Heather Woods Broderick from the band. I recall the first time, Sharon, I heard your voice. I stood there. The hairs were going up on the back of my neck and I felt like I was rendered inert. Someone could have taken my wallet, my phone, my brain probably. I'm wondering if you've ever used your voice to pacify or to get results. <laughs> um. Maybe not in the way where it would harm somebody else, like <laughs> make you get robbed or whatever. That would be weird. Um, I I write music and sing to to get through my own problems and to hopefully help other people, you know, get through a hard time. If that's what you mean. Yeah, you've <laughs> had a strong musical upbringing, tackling a variety of instruments. Would you say that through choir you discovered the, the best instrument, which is your voice? I got to explore it a lot more, definitely, and I, without realizing it at the time, I, I learned how to write harmonies, which I think I didn't realize until much later. You've really got a wonderful symbiotic relationship with Heather. I noticed on stage there's constant eye contact, and tell us more about those harmonies, because they're, they're quite interesting. I I think, unlike most songs, I think they're not just you know, they're not supposed to be in the background, you know, they're right up there with the melody, and I think they're just as strong as the melody, and I've never been able to sing with anyone that could pull it off or or just believe them when you sing them, and someone as strong as a vocalist is Heather. It's pretty amazing to be able to, to sing together all the time and to connect on stage and just be able to make eye contact and be able to have that kind of connection in front of an audience is very rare and I think I'm still learning how to do it and sometimes it can be a cold atmosphere or something but just being able to connect with somebody in that way is very rare. You've stated somewhere that you found it when you were younger difficult to communicate or express yourself and that your mother gave you some advice or a tool to help with that. Can you talk about that? (laughs) Yeah, my... My mother gave me a journal at a really young age, probably when, I think around the time I was starting to go through puberty or something, but I I didn't like talking about my emotions. I didn't really talk about much. You know, I was just this quiet, angsty kid. So she gave me a notebook so I would just get it out in some way, even if it wasn't to anyone. It was just for myself to be able to learn how to, you know, express myself in some way. And they eventually turned into, that's how I write my songs now, but it, at the time, I didn't realize that's what it would be. It's been documented that you escaped an abusive relationship where your creativity was quashed. And I can appreciate then that through the personal vehicle of songwriting, you've been able to use that as a cathartic process. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, when I lived in Tennessee, I, I wrote a lot, but I rarely performed out. You know, it wasn't encouraged, but I mean, at least not by the person I was with at the time, but I had friends that definitely were trying to support me and push me out there. But it wasn't until I moved back home to New Jersey and I stayed with my parents and they gave me a laptop so I could record on the internal mic of it because it had GarageBand on there. And I started recording all these songs that I had started writing all those years ago and that turned into the first record that I released on Language of Stone. So the experience you've had obviously was good fuel and we would hope that you don't have continue having those kind of experiences. <laughs> what does that then mean for the future songwriting of Sharon Van And if you're going into a happy place, are you going to channel that into what you do? I am going to try my best to write happier songs. I do think, though, when I start writing, it's usually because I'm going through a really hard time with something, but... Things are mostly, you know, they're much better than they used to be, and I think they are more optimistic and they more have a more pop element to them, and I think they are overall more happy. But I do think that there's still some darkness that remains in there, which I think is good. You've had an incredible response in your time here in Australia, various TV and radio performances, and this is off the back of touring your album Tramp. I'm wondering... Is travel one of the great benefits of touring or are you getting, you're sort of looking forward to getting home and just chilling out? 
I think it's just a little bit of both, you know. I mean, I love, I mean, it's such an honor to get to travel Australia and see places I've never been to before and and to meet people that I never would have gotten to meet and just, I don't know, like it's, I, mean, I know how lucky I am. But on the other hand, I've only been home probably two months all year and I would really like to be home for a little while so I can actually reflect on everything I've been through this year so I can write something new. But I think you need a little bit of both worlds to do what we do. So will you take a little time out before you sort of get back into the studio then? Yeah, I have two months off after this tour and then I go on a a short US tour. With Nick Cave? (laughs) With Nick Cave. How does that feel? I can't even... It's not even really registering right now. I heard that you saw him on the street in Melbourne. I thought you might have gone up and sort of shook his hand or something. Well, he was walking up the street with his son and I didn't want to bother him. But like in the back of my mind, I'm freaking out. I'm just like, I'm going to tour with you in a couple of months and you have no idea who I am. But hi. Uh, I just, I couldn't do it. You know, I just kind of let him walk. He walked by and I made a weird face and that was our exchange. Show us that face for our video. (laughs) <laughs> I wish you could see it. You can go online and look at the video a little later. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one last geeky question. You spoke of geeks. Well, I'm one of them, sadly, because as well as collecting music, my other passion is wine. And I read somewhere that you had this sort of fork in the road where you could have pursued a wine career or music. T- tell me about that. Are you, are you a wine nerdlinger? <laughs> I am. I uh, When I moved back home, with my parents in my early 20s, I I got a job at the local wine store called Perry Villa Wine and Spirits in New Jersey. And I I didn't know very much about wine. I just knew I liked Spanish wines, like Rioja Reds. And I, in the interview, you know, I basically had a really funny interview because they're like, just tell us anything we need to know about you. And I was like, well, I'm... I see a therapist, I'm just getting off probation, I go to community college, and I really like Rioja wine, and I'm a really hard worker. And they were just like, all right, you're hired, that's cool, thanks for being honest. And they ended up investing a lot of time in me to learn more about wine, and I started doing tastings, and pairings like learning how to do pairings and then eventually I got to pick wines that I like to bring into the store and you know to help you know sell them but it was a really small humble store but it was really run by a really wonderful family. Sharon thanks for coming into the studio today I hope you might grace us with one last song before you leave. Yes of course thank you.
your world unfolding.